Welcome, everyone. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a perspective, again, from my own parochial interests. I was asked to comment a little bit on what I perceive to be some of the big problems in social science and coping with data complexity. When I saw the nature of the audience, I realized that many of the things I might want to say would be apparent to many of you. Nevertheless, I hope the remarks I might make might be somewhat synthetic and that I might give some examples from, again, my own particular perspective uh, on what I see to be the problems and the promise of some of the methods and data that we have to bring to bear on some of the problems that Gary just outlined. Now, I want to acknowledge my collaborator in much of the work on social networks that I do, who is James Fowler, who's sitting in the back. And I'm going to be presenting some other work that I've done in collaboration with Kevin Lewis and Jason Kaufman, and also with Laszlo Barabashi, who's also sitting here. Now, um, so in discussing some of these big problems on social science and computation, I want to focus on social networks. But many of the problems and computational challenges that we face are faced in other uh, types of data and other kinds of work that people are doing. And most generally, my own research group is interested in how illness and healthcare and healthcare use and disability and death in one person can spread and cause illness and healthcare use and disability and death and health behaviors in other people to whom the first person is connected. How can we get a kind of non-biological spread of disease, a kind of sociological spread of disease? How can we track it in real time? How can we look at it in tiny units of analysis whether they're minutes or days or individual people and so or particular diseases or particular kinds of interactions and so forth. Now, our first example uh, looking at this was, uh, was the spread of obesity in social networks. So it had become very trendy to speak about uh, obesity being an epidemic. And James and I began to wonder whether, in fact, obesity really did exhibit epidemic properties. Was there a sense in which weight gain in one person could be transmitted to other people to whom a person is connected. So we assembled a data set of about 12,000 people using a very well-known study known as the Framingham Heart Study. These were individuals who had been followed for 32 years and had come in to be weighed every four years. And we used archived paper records, nothing like what we could do in the future. We had to retrieve these paper records, manually key them into a database, and reconstruct the social network ties of the individuals across this period of time. And having done so, we can show some uh, animations like the one I'm about to show you. This animation here shows uh, individuals, are, of course, are nodes. And we make the size of the node proportional to the person's BMI. So fatter people get bigger nodes. <laughs> uh, and then the perimeter of the node indicates the gender of the person. So this is beginning to get a feel for the covariate complexity of the data. So the red perimeter nodes are women, and the blue perimeter nodes are men. Then we can also index the nature of the ties between people. Uh, gray ties indicate spousal ties. So this woman, obese woman, is married to this non-obese man. And then the purple ties indicate friendship ties. So this man, is, this is this other man's close friend over here. So what we're going to do now in a moment is, is we're going to put the network into motion. We're going to take daily cuts through this network for 32 years. And we're going to watch as people gain weight or lose weight. People can be born into the network or die and drop away. Ties can form and disappear, so the topology will change across time. And our objective here is to see, can we trace a spread of obesity within the network? Can we see as one person gains weight, do others gain weight? There's a woman up towards the top there. I don't have a pointer who's going to gain weight in a minute and move, move to the center of the network. There she goes. Uh, there she goes, sort of causing obesity uh, everywhere uh, around her. She just moves right to the center of the network. Uh, just because of gravity? Is that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so, there, so that's, that is the f sort of one big visual rendition of the kind of work we're interested in. When we first started doing this work, our fantasy was the following, borrowing some ideas from physics. I thought it would be possible for us to imagine a certain person gaining weight and then as this person gained weight, to watch a kind of wave of obesity spread out from around them, spreading from this individual person, causing weight gain in first degree removed alters, then second degree, third degree, and so forth, uh, in a kind of like a dropping a pebble in a still pond. 
you get these waves that spread out from the pebble, these concentric circles. They might hit the perimeter, bounce back, and you could get interference patterns. And we imagine that you might have these kind of peaks and valleys of obesity and thinness within a kind of sociotopological space. And our hope had been, through the reconstruction of this network, with the data that we had available to us, that we could see these peaks and valleys. So that we could see this person gain weight and then it kind of bloom around them. Incidentally, we're not just looking at weight gain, we're looking at many behaviors. Uh, some new work we've done, we're looking at happiness, and we can see the spread of happiness in the network. I get happy, it makes Gary make, get happy, and it makes Sandy get miserable. Uh, <laughs> spreading from person to person. Anyway, uh, but what we found when we did this kind of visualization I just showed you is that we didn't see this. We didn't see this kind of spreading out. And the reason, of course, is that obesity is not a unicentric epidemic. It's a multicentric epidemic. So it's like not throwing a pebble in the pond, but a whole handful of gravel into the pond. So you get these complex interference patterns, these kind of choppy surface, so it's very hard to discern what's going on. And this then in turn requires the invention of a variety of new methods that allow you to find the signal in the noise, discern what's really go going on, and recover the plunk of a single pebble. Um, so in fact, so, so things in this kind of world that I just described you can be very complicated. We have multiple nodes. Behind each node is a covariate vector that describes the attributes of the node, their BMI, their gender, and a whole host of other things. The topology can be complicated, and all of that can change across time. And in fact, it can get more complicated still. Uh, this is our maps. Uh, I apologize for the quality of the image. This shows the location of the participants in our study uh, in Framingham and adjoining towns. Uh, on the left-hand side, we co-map their geographic location and put green lines that connect uh, friendship ties. So if two people are friends, we draw a green line between them. And on the right, we have sibling ties. Again, a very high level of social and geographical complexity, which we're trying, first of all, to visualize and secondarily to analyze. Now, this illustrates a broader set of topics that are being engaged by social scientists because of the explosion in geocoding and geotracking geo technologies, which Gary's already alluded to, and many of you are no doubt familiar. But one could generalize still further and create a two-node networks, for example, mapping restaurants in space according to their sharing of clients, which we're beginning to do with our data, uh, mapping the location of all these restaurants. I wish we had the cell phone data so we could see who was at the restaurant when uh, and track them across time and in space and in, in motion. Um, and one can begin to test claims uh, such as our claim that the placement in social space is or is not more important than placement in geographic space. When, when does it matter more where you are and when does it matter more who you know? And can we in real time ascertain these kinds of properties about large groups of people at the same time? Now there has of course been an explosion in the scale of social network studies made possible by the accumulating, uh, by communication technologies and by what I call massive passive uh, data acquisition. So one of the classic studies uh, which I put there first was published by an anthropologist by the name of Zachary uh, on the Karate Club, the very famous Karate Club data set. It involved 34 people. Uh, there was a fissioning of the club between two club leaders. Uh, he had very static information about these people. Uh, and since then, there's just been an incredible explosion. Uh, in 2003, this 436-node network of email exchanges over three months at a corporate lab, 43,553-node uh, network of email exchanges over two years, because since it's a net in 2006, not to be, you know, I've done more, 4.4 million node network of uh, declared friendships in the live journal blogging community, 4.6 million node network of phone users in Europe that Barabashi and his colleagues have done. You'll hear more about that later today. 240 million node network of all IMs over one month in MS Instant Messenger, and then whatever Gary is working on at the moment, uh, <laughs> which will be bigger than anything else uh, on the page. <laughs> so, so Zachary's study was illustrative of the classic studies. It was limited in the size of the network, uh, in the number of discernible ties, uh, in its longitudinality, and in our ability to resolve what's actually going on uh, between the individuals involved. And the new data is, that is available is making it possible, uh, on the other hand, to see more of the world, see properties not previously discernible, and to study rare events, for example, like suicide, which is of great interest but is difficult to discern if you have small samples. Now, on the other hand, the links uh, may be sociologically meaningless, these links that we find, or methodologically intractable. What does it mean, for example, to have a 1,000 Facebook friends? Is there any sense in which these are really sociologically speaking meaningful friends that you might have? Or what does it mean to exchange a single IM message with someone else out of 240 million uh, nodes exchanging messages? 
These questions are prompting a variety of conceptual and methodological innovations.